notification that you went live two minutes ago, but it, it disappeared. All right, I think now, let's see, hopefully we are live on um, emerging revolutionary war. Um, so sorry about that. I actually went live on my personal page. So for all those folks that are not friends with me, uh, we're going to restart uh, right now. So we are talking 18th century weaponry. This is Red War Revelry. I'm with T. Logan Metis, uh, formerly at two minutes ago. the National Park Service. Formerly, right, I think now, um, let's see, hopefully we are live on um, emerging sorry. revolutionary war. Um, so sorry about that. I actually went live on my personal page. So for all those folks that are not friends with me, uh, we're going to restart uh, right now. So we are Tone 18th century weaponry. This is Red War Revelry. I'm with T. Logan Metis, uh, formerly of two minutes ago. the National Park Service. There you go. Formerly of the National All right. So let's. <laughs> I don't know. Are we doing this? Where are you? This is what I get for knowing a new system tonight. There you yeah, go. Yeah. All I right. Think we're so, good, though. We are good. So we are on emerging rev war, rev war rubbery. Apologize for all the technical difficulties. It is definitely me. This is why I work for the National Park Service and not an IT company. Uh, but we are with T. Logan Metis, uh, formerly the National Park Service, Smithsonian's, and the National Rifle Association Museum. He is uh, the founder of uh, High Caliber History, so we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but thanks, Logan, for dealing with all my technical difficulties. Um, but let's restart with the 50,000 foot view of 18th century weaponry. Um, we have all these random terms, brown bass. Um, we hear that the French gave a bunch of Charleville uh, muskets to the, and so forth. And then grasshoppers, three founders, et cetera. So sure. um, for people who are just tuning in and knows nothing about 18th century weaponry, what's that big high level view? Sure. So the big high level view uh, is going to be that there is some standardization and some order uh, with the British and their muskets uh, and, and their weaponry overall. But uh, the only commonality to the colonial weapons is that there is no commonality. Um, it's, it's a little bit of everything. It's a hodgepodge. Uh, you know, since, since we are literally at, at the birth of a nation here and, and the colonies are coming together and trying to come together anyway, and, and they've been so disparate uh, for most of their existence, really. I mean, each colony was kind of its own individual country almost, uh, and they've, they've all got their own requirements for their militia service and, and things of that nature. And so there is no standardized weapon store uh, uh, you know, that they can go to, like with the, with the British, you know, you've got the ordnance board and they're going and grabbing guns from the tower uh, and issuing them out to guys, putting them on ships and sending them over here to the colonies. That doesn't exist here. You're getting a bunch of volunteer militiamen uh, who are all bringing their own firearms with them. Um, in some small instances, you're going to be dealing with localities where uh, the local militia units would have had a store of firearms that they would issue to their militia members. But for the most part, it's just catch as catch can and, and bring whatever you can. Uh, and so just as like when you look at, at a, you know, paintings of, of Rev War battle scenes and, and the militia units all gathered together, it's a hodgepodge of uniforms and, you know, uh, especially early on, uh, you, you, they look more like a ragtag bunch of guys than, than they do any kind of a battle hardened unit with any uh, semblance of order. And it was the same way with their firearms. It was, uh, it was really hard. You, you know, you might be standing next to a guy who's got his, his duck hunting gun and, you know, next to a guy who's got a really nice uh, long rifle, you know, maybe he's got a little bit more money and it was custom made. Um, and that creates huge problems in terms of the logistics for things, in terms of supplying the soldiers. Um, and so uh, it's, it is an absolute nightmare um, from an ordinance and a quartermaster and supply perspective, trying to keep the men armed. I mean, supplies were always in short supply. Uh, during the Rev War uh, across the board for us here in the colonies and, and, and it just it did not help you know okay you may get uh, get your hands on 500 1,000 1500 musket balls but 
well, they might not be the right caliber for all the guns that the guys have. And so you're, you're finding yourself severely limited um, by the tremendous variety of weaponry that we're coming up against. So, I mean, as you come, the, when, so the difference between the British, I mean, they're coming with what is called the brown vest. So do you know where the term brown vest comes from? Sure. So that's, that's an interesting story. And the etymology of that is, is kind of lost to history. Uh, but there are a number of well-versed uh, British military historians who uh, think they have it pinned down pretty well. Um, and the one gentleman who, who I, I trust his opinion on it most, he happens to be a friend of mine, uh, and he is the keeper of arms and artillery at the Royal Armories uh, in Leeds over in England. His name is Jonathan Ferguson. Um, and the, the best way we can think the term brown best comes about um, is, is interesting, and you have to understand some British slang. Um, and brown was used as a term for someone or something that was just very average. It was very plain. It was kind of blah, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, Phil, you and I would kind of be classified as brown guys. You know, we're uh, we're <laughs> we're uh, we're just your average Joe, right? You know, we're uh, we're not Casanova. We are not, my friend, right? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you get that term brown, um, and then best was a derogatory term uh, that was often used for uh, working girls uh, over in, in England. And so um, if you're a brown best, you know, you're kind of just a, a plain looking girl. Um, and, and that gets applied to the firearm because the thought process with that, and you see it you know, we hear it in different movies and stuff uh, through today. You know, this is my rifle. This is my friend. You know, yada yada. Um, you know, you, this keep this firearm close to you. She's she's your best girl. You know, and so you get these brown best muskets. They're very plain guns. There's nothing. You know, they're not fancy, uh, but they get the job done. They feel good in hand, and and so you you trust them with your life. And so uh, the, that brown bass, you know, she's, she's not the best looking girl, but she's reliable and she's dependable and she feels good. So. And so hopefully keep you alive, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's one of those that that's most likely where that term comes from. Um, it, it has nothing to do uh, with, with the treatment of the metal, um, which was sometimes called browning, but that wasn't done uh, on, on those guns at that time. Um, it also has nothing to do with the wood being brown. Um, it just, it really requires you to kind of dig deep into the, the British slang of the day. And you realize that that, that musket is actually a working class girl. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's this standard issue. Am I correct that there are multiple like the, it goes through revisions, right? Or updates. It's not just one typical brown vest because um, they date back into the French and Indian War, if I'm not the brown vest, right? So, right. So, yeah, brown vest is is kind of the, the generic catch-all term. And, and it's, it's hard to kind of pin down a standardization to that because even though the British Ordnance Board has established a, a set pattern for, the, for these muskets, it's still important to remember that these guns are all still handmade. Um, there is no such thing as interchangeable parts uh, in, in the grand scheme of things like we know it. Um, and and the, the pattern names and things generally as time goes on, it becomes almost more of a collector mentality and a historian mentality to want to assign, you know, a specific year and make and model a short land pattern, long land pattern, Oftentimes, uh, they they were referred to as the you know like the old king's pattern once it got replaced by a new design, and then that one is you know the the one we've got now is the new king's pattern. But when it gets updated, that new king's pattern becomes the old king's pattern, and it rolls on like that. And so your your average soldier uh, at that time 
you know, the, these guns are as individual as the next one, but they're also as uniform as the next one, if that makes any sense. Um, and so there are different makes and models, but the variances to them are much more nuanced and slight than the average soldier would notice. It's not like today where you've got an entire infantry outfit in the army, they all get, you know, a standard issue M4. That gun is exactly the same, like the 100,000 of them made before it and the 100,000 of them that'll get made after it. It's not like that, you know, so you've got this British army that are all armed, you know, with the same essential model of brown bass, but those guns could technically all be slightly different from one another and yet still be the same thing at the same time. <laughs> So that leads me to another question for you. So if they're all the different but the same, how how do they find musket balls for them? Like, is it are they standard or are they just? I mean, we we, we that other war that happens later, I think in the 1860s, we call it the Civil War. Everything's pretty standard, and they mass produce bullets or whatever. But if everything's the same but different, is that why the caliber of musket balls were was different as well? Um, well, th thankfully, uh, one of the things that they did keep the same was your bore diameter. Um, so there may be smaller changes with the different uh, with the different uh, best patterns and, and models, um, but caliber is going to remain the same there. Um, and thankfully, it's it's a lot easier, faster, and cheaper to make bullet molds uh, than it is to make muskets. And so, uh, you know, you could, if you needed, you could probably find someone who had a bullet mold uh, in the correct caliber that you needed. And then, you know, you could melt down your wrong caliber balls and then cast them into the right caliber ones if you needed to. Um, and of course, that's certainly much more of an issue here in the colonies than it would have been uh, for the British. So, and talking about the colonies, so, there, I mean, there, it's got to be what relics from the French and Indian War. There's got to be hunting pieces. There are rifles and so forth. Um, yep. I'm, I mean, what do you, I guess the question is, is what was in, say, the New York campaign or what it, the Continental Soldier, what was, was there a standard weapon or was it like, holy crap, we got 40 different types of muskets and rifles. Right. Shoot something back at the British. Right. Yeah, it was. It, it was. Uh, the standard was no standard, really, uh, for the most part. Um, and and it was, you know, we were trying to get an entire fighting force up and running as quick as possible. And so it's just grab a gun and get to the field kind of right. Um, but they realize fairly early on during the revolution uh, that, that this isn't working. We need a standardized way to to, to at least keep track of the guns. If we can't standardize the guns themselves, we need to at least be able to keep track of what we've got so that we can kind of plan for that. And so uh, in, in the months before we actually uh, declared independence in the spring of 76, uh, George Washington is writing back and forth uh, to the Board of War with the Continental Congress. And the Board of War at that time in that particular iteration uh, included both John Adams and Benjamin Harrison V, who is the grandfather and great grandfather of a couple of our later presidents. Um, and he writes to them and says, we, we need to find a way to take all of the guns that are in service to us uh, that are owned by the government at this time, not the personal arms, but the, the guns that are being used and owned by the government and brand them essentially, stamp them um, with you states is, is what Washington suggests. Um, and within a couple of weeks, they, they do adopt that. Uh, and there are a number of not only firearms, but you'll also see it on canteens and, and a variety of other things. Uh, the, the firearms in the stock uh, will be branded, sometimes just U states, uh, and sometimes it's both words, United States, that are being stamped uh, into the stock of that gun uh, to acknowledge it as being, uh, you know, uh, government property, which I think is really cool because it's, it's happening, like I said, very early on. They're, they're debating uh, putting these weapons uh, and, and identifying these weapons 
as belonging to the United States, and yet the United States doesn't even exist yet. So it's really cool that they're they're trying to to put that identity into these weapons uh, for such a fledgling nation. Really, um, you know, it, it's just kind of neat. And I mean, that I guess leads to another point of that. Is, I mean, you have we always, I guess, most historian, most history history enthusiasts think, oh wow, like kind of army's formed. It's got a quartermaster department. It's got a commissary department. It's got an ordnance department. But I mean, there are, are they, there's no really supply, I mean, of, of muskets or whatever. I mean, what is, if you don't, if you don't come to the war and list with a gun, is the Continental Congress giving you a musket? Is the states giving you a musket? Like, if you don't have a gun, right, who gives you one? I mean, they need bodies, but they need to give you a gun too, right? Right. Well, and, and, and again, and that's, there's, there's really no standard to that. And, and that's why we see such a scramble when they're putting together units. Um, you know, you've got guys bringing guns from home and, and you've got, you know, some local militias, like I mentioned that, that happen to have a storehouse of guns uh, because of their local laws. But it's also why we see such a huge influx uh, of French firearms in service here, you know, obviously the French gave us tremendous, tremendous help during the revolution in, in a variety of different ways. But one of those ways was weaponry, um, and so we we end up bringing in uh, swaths of of British weapons. Uh, we're using uh, a large number of Dutch weapons as well, um, and and it's just it's all being cobbled together, catch as catch can, to get everyone as up to speed as quick as possible. Uh, because the colonies just didn't have the ability to put that all together themselves. They, they just didn't uh, in any aspect, you know. So just as we relied on friendly nations throughout the world uh, for other support and aid, we also turned to them uh, in terms of firearms. And, you know, France was a, a tremendous help with that. And it uh, certainly didn't hurt that France had and still has some of the, the you know the, some of the finest firearms manufacturers in the world. And certainly at that time they were absolutely top notch. And so um, to to get some guns from France was was definitely a big help. All right. So I mean, thought about it. There was no arm manufacturing in the colonies at the time, right? It was. I mean, I think there was a guy named Dickert who made rifles in what Pennsylvania or whatever, and and so forth, but they were individual gunsmiths, right? There was no, right. like we talk in France, like um, the Charleville musket, like that was based off of a, a, right, an armory in Charleville, or was there a guy named Charleville? Because there's also something called what, the Saint Etienne, Saint Etienne which is one of the armories over there. Is it the same, different? Is it that a location or a person? Uh, Saint Etienne is a location. Okay. Um, and, and there was also gun making in Versailles. And, and so, uh, yeah, the, you're right. There, there were uh, state established and state run uh, armories and arsenals and stuff over in, in Great Britain and in France. Um, but no, we, we had nothing like that. It was all individual gunsmiths and craftsmen making firearms. Um, you know, George Washington ends up setting up the site for, uh, for what becomes Springfield Armory. Um, and he is scoping that out and, and setting that up right during the revolution. Um, but the armory itself uh, doesn't get up and running until after the revolution, after we are established as a country. So, um, so no, we, we do not have uh, a, a national armory of, of any kind uh, during the revolution. We are relying solely on um, privately made firearms and uh, government contract arms coming from foreign countries. So that's what makes it amazing. I mean, we, the folklore of the American Revolution is the Over Mountain Boys or Daniel Morgan's Riflemen or whoever else. Um, so, I mean, these guys are coming with their own weapons. I mean, the right, I mean, so let me ask this question. This is, let's go off on a random topic. Uh, you're going into a war. Are you going to want a musket or a rifle personally? If you're going to, join up the continental army oh man that's you know short answer yes with an if long answer no with a but 
Um, <laughs> I, I think in, in terms of if I want to just be able to stay in the fight as long as possible, uh, I'm probably going to choose a musket. Um, if, uh, if I think maybe I might, uh, be doing something a little slightly more clandestine, hiding in trees, maybe trying to pick off some, some officers, I'm definitely going to want a rifle, right? Um, and, and there are pros and cons to, to both, but I, I think in terms of being able to keep yourself in the fight the longest, um, uh, you would choose a musket, um, you know, cause you're, even though, yeah, with the rifle, you're going to have the ability to fire uh, more accurately at a longer distance. That's just not the, the reality of the type of warfare that they're fighting at that time. Right. You know, so you've, you've got this gun and this advantage and you don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to use it. Um, one good example with a rifle though, would be, uh, we're probably all familiar. You've probably heard the story of the the, the British sharpshooter who has a uh, a continental officer in his sights, and uh, and I think it was at the Battle of Brandywine, and and he's gonna he's gonna take the shot, but the officer's not facing him, and he doesn't know he's there, and so that's there's still this idea of gentlemanly war, and so he doesn't take the shot at the guy uh, because it wouldn't have been the gentlemanly thing to do. And then later on, uh, this guy finds out, he's like, oh, well, we think that was George Washington, you know, and, and have you heard that story yeah. before, Phil? The, the Brandywine, yeah. It's basically <laughs> yeah. Pat Ferguson. Dude. Exactly. It's pretty, uh, Ferguson, what, a Ferguson rifle or musket? Ferguson rifle, yep. And the Ferguson rifle is, is a fascinating piece of technology because, you know, this is in an era of, of single shot muzzle loading smooth bore firearms and so not only has he created something that's rifled so you're getting the better accuracy but it's also a breech loading design uh, and so the way that works is that it's actually got a screw breech and so the trigger guard is actually the screw handle and you unscrew uh, and and it actually lowers down the breech block a circular piece of the breech block lowers down and you load your powder and ball cartridge in there and then twist your trigger guard back into place to lock the breech back into, into battery. And then you would go ahead uh, and fire it like a flintlock. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating design and it's, uh, it really was ahead of its time. Um, Patrick Ferguson was really onto something. Um, and, and that gun could have been an awesome game changer, but it, its development gets cut short because his life gets cut short. Uh, Ferguson is killed at King's Mountain, uh, and uh, and and with him goes the gun. Probably by a rifle, right? Uh, from an overmounted <laughs> boy, yeah, who uh, I've seen multiple times. But uh, I mean, that's that. I guess at least another uh, question. I mean, besides muskets and, and rifles, I mean, um, I can't. Oh, I've worked at Morristown as a um, National Historical Park on a detail, and they had pistols there. I mean, pistols are the same way, right? Uh, they're not, I mean, they're not the Colt revolvers that we think of later on in the wild, wild west of the civil war. I mean, they're, they're this, they're loaded the same way, right? I mean, how do pistols yep. in the 18th century, I mean, they got a ramrod, correct? Or am right. I wrong? Yep. Nope. You're absolutely right. They're, they're single shot pistols. Um, and they're, they're large. Um, they, they call them horse pistols. Uh, and they call them that primarily because, you are carrying them uh, in a, a set of holsters that fit on the pommel of your saddle. Um, you know, the guns are big and unwieldy to try to put them into a belt holster. You know, it's, it's going to pull your pants down, right? Um, so, so they call them uh, horse pistols because they are big guns. Uh, and they, just like all the others, are craft-made designs. You know, there's here in the colonies anyway, you know, they're craft-made designs. There's no standard make or model for them. Um, the only commonality that they have is that they're all going to be flintlock and they're going to be muzzle loading uh, and 99.9% .9 of them are going to be smooth bore. So, um, so you have smooth bore muskets, smooth bore um, pistols. Um, so when you recently, I mean, Lexington Concord, you hear that these light troops came out, the Grenadiers came out, and then you have the, obviously the 
the Marines and then back home, the regular companies of British infantry. Were the brown vests the standard issue for the light troops and grenadiers, or were they carrying something else as they marched out? So you may have heard the terms, we've got the, the short land pattern and the long land pattern uh, in terms of the brown vests and, and the difference in that, uh, obviously short and long, it's the length of the barrel. It's usually a difference of about four inches. Um, and so uh, you're gonna have your, your main standard infantry body with you know, the long land pattern um, and, and your more quicker moving, uh, more agile troops uh, you may see them issued with the short land pattern um, because that gun is easier to maneuver. Um, you know, four inches may not sound like a whole lot when you're talking about a gun that's so large uh, overall, but you know, it, it does make a difference. Um, and so, so you will see differences uh, in some units getting the long land pattern, some getting the short land pattern. But as I said, those are still essentially the exact same gun. One's just a hair shorter than the other. So um, they're, they're exactly the same, but completely different. Gotcha. I mean, I'm, I've always been uh, connect, or fond of the Grenadiers because they said they were the biggest, strongest guys and I'm six foot five. So if I was living in the 18th century, they stick me in the Grenadiers and more than oh, yeah. likely I would be one of the first ones shot because I'm six foot five. I mean, uh, <laughs> with a red beard, but um, going back a uh, question, um, we have a uh, comment says, were the pistols actually of any relevance? Usually they're not so accurate. Were pistol, what were the relevancy of pistols in the 18th century? No, I, I think the, the relevancy of a pistol then is the relevancy of a pistol today. That is a close quarters combat weapon. You know, if, if, if you're in a fighting situation, it's always better to fight with a rifle. Uh, it, you know, uh, handgun, modern mentality is your handgun is meant to fight to your rifle. Uh, and it's, it's kind of the same thing there, but with the caveat that, uh, and, and it was this way through, through that later war that you and I are, are familiar with 80 years later, uh, uh, in well, that, yeah. yeah, uh, in that we're dealing with a hierarchy in the military and officers are carrying pistols. Um, and it was very much the same way during the Revolutionary War. As I mentioned, you were calling them horse pistols because they're in uh, pommel holsters. Well, your, your average soldier is, is not on horseback. So, uh, so you've got the officers on horseback with the pistols because those muskets, your traditional musket is just far too long and unwieldy to load and fire. Um, so the pistols are important for your officers who aren't going to be carrying long arms. Um, and, and if you find yourself in a, you know, in a course close quarters combat situation, um, a pistol is certainly a lot more maneuverable um, than, than your standard musket. So yes, they, they do have their place and they do have their merit, um, but it is also very regimented in, in the military hierarchy as to who will and will not have them. It's not to say you don't have some guys who will go out and privately purchase things, um, you know, because one is none and, and two is one. And, and if, you know, if you can afford to have a pistol or two tucked into your belt, in addition to your standard infantry musket, why not? Right. I mean, you're only getting one shot off at a time. So if you can keep them all loaded and have some pistols, that's great. Um, so they were important. Um, but, but you're right. They, you know, they're not terribly accurate. You're not really reaching out and touching someone. Um, but you know, but in spitting distance, perfect to have a pistol with you. So, um, uh, and thought about, I mean, fire and not accuracy. Uh, we, I mean, in the later war, they have cartridge boxes and so forth. I mean, with, in the Rev war, what, how did the soldiers carry their musket balls or, or I mean, cause you, it's a different type of musket. You got to pour stuff in and so forth. So, sure. uh, yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just like in that previous war or in that later war, uh, sorry, we're jumping, doing a little back to the future. Um, there are still cartridge boxes. That's uh, that is a, a standard piece of equipment. So the British Army, they're all going to be issued cartridge boxes. Um, and they look a little different. They're more uh, long and squat than they are uh, the more boxy shaped ones that you see 80 years later. Um, 
but so so you will see cartridge boxes in standardized troops they will be carrying those but you know your average ragtag guy you know if, if you're lucky enough to be in a more formal continental regiment you know you, you may have a cartridge box with them but the average guy you know you may just in in a satchel or a haversack you may have you know a fistful of cartridges uh stuff down into there or uh, you're going to have, you know, a, a bag full of your round ball and your powder horn. Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna depend. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the the only the only thing standard was how non-standard it was, except for the British. They're you know they're gonna be uh, issued you know cartridge boxes and better equipment and stuff like that. So. Perfect. Um, so let's test your knowledge a little bit. We have a question in from a guy named Robert Ryan. So did the 1728 French Rampart, was that used by any provisional colonial militia? Do you know anything about French 1728 muskets? Uh, wondering if they would have been used during the Revolutionary yeah. War. Or they're too um, I, I would say never say never. Yeah. Um, and especially because, you know, we're, we're in a situation where every gun counts. Um, and so I, I would think that, that if you were in a situation where you needed a firearm, you know, even though that pattern is literally half a century old, uh, by the time we get to the revolution, the fact of the matter is that weaponry in the 18th century didn't evolve a whole lot. Uh, and so even though that particular pattern gun is, is going to be half a century old, it's still going to be relevant. Um, how prevalent they were, uh, I, I don't know. I couldn't say. Um, but again, you know, like I said, never say never. Uh, if if there was one here, uh, and you needed a gun, I don't think you'd snub your nose at it. Oh, it's, yeah, it keeps you between life and death. Yeah, you're carrying a 1728 or 1763 or whatnot. Um, exactly. So let's spend a few minutes. Uh, let's we're talking about muskets, rifles, pistols. Uh, let's test your knowledge. Do you have uh, artillery pieces? Um, we have, I mean, we hear later on, I mean, obviously Napoleon is a big cannon, but what is the standard issue of an artillery piece in the Revolutionary War? Is it a 12 or 24 pounder or are they smaller? That's a great question. Um, and, and admittedly, artillery is, is not my strong point. Um, I am much more of a, a small arms guy. Um, uh, Henry Knox and I would have had very little in common. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I would hate to speak out a turn on that. Um, I, I, like I said, I just, artillery is, is not something I know a whole lot about. We had mentioned briefly earlier, you know, talking about the little grasshopper uh, cannons. Um, and, and of course, you know, they get their name from the way they look. Guys were saying uh, that they look like grasshoppers uh, with the ears that stick up on them. Um, I've also heard some people saying, you know, because it's, that was what, a, it was a three pound ball, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, that's that's a relatively light ball um, and it kind of it'll hop through the grass as it's uh, going down the field, as it's taken out lines. And I've heard people say they thought the name came from from that aspect of it as well. Yeah. It would make sense to me. Uh, I, I can see relevance in both of those, you know. So and so we'll switch back to us. I mean, there are I mean, you go to a place like Springfield Armory, which is a National Historic Site, or you go to yeah. even Harper's Ferry or um, the NRA Museum and so forth. You see these cool designs. You've worked in a lot of these different museums and parks. Is there an awesome random design that the average person wouldn't know that was an 18th century weapon? Something like that just completely baffled you. Sure. So the, the things that I really like are the early attempts at repeating firearms. Uh, and one of my favorite stories with repeating arms comes about in Philadelphia from a gunsmith by the name of Joseph Belton. And Belton had come up supposedly with an idea for a repeating rifle that, depending on which letter you refer to, could fire from anywhere to six to 20 shots without needing to be reloaded. And he starts writing to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia uh, in the spring of 1777. He's telling him he has these guns uh, and he's interested in demonstrating them to the Congress and he thinks they will be tremendously beneficial and essentially it's, it's going to make 
you know, one man the equivalent of a hundred men uh, in terms of outfitting them and in costs because they're able to get off so many more shots before they need to reload. And Congress is like, hey, that's that's awesome. If we can do more with less, hey, you know, if we know anything about the government, it's do more with less, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and so they say, yeah, that's great. Uh, whether you need to retrofit or make new ones, let's put in an order uh, for, I think it was a thousand guns. Um, how much is it going to cost? And he comes back with this price that is exorbitant. I mean, and it is just grossly expensive. And he counters by saying, well, you, you couldn't outfit a hundred men completely with uniforms and tents and canteens and haversacks and rifles and bayonets for what I'm charging. Um, so that's really a, a reasonable fee. And they're like, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're not buying it. So then he cuts his price in half and like, yeah, no, we're, we're still not buying it. Then he uh, writes another letter and recruits uh, a number of prominent individuals from the era to try to vouch for him. So the letter is actually signed by Benedict Arnold while he was still on our side. Uh, and it's also signed by David Rittenhouse uh, with the, um, uh, he was the, the astronomer and, and scientist uh, of the era. So he had some big name guys vouching for him that, you know, hey, you should, you should look into this. Um, but it's still, it's just, the money is too much. So he sends yet another letter uh, really, uh, really getting angry at this point. And, uh, and he tries to throw it in their face. And he said, well, other countries like Great Britain would easily pay twice as much to protect their men. Well, it's probably not best to insult your potential client, right? Um, yeah. So, so it, it doesn't work. It, it, the gun never comes to fruition. They're never able to come to terms on money. And Congress doesn't ever end up getting any of these belt and repeating flintlock rifles. But the concept and the story to me is so cool um, because can you imagine if they had actually managed to come to an agreement on price, if we could have had guys, you know, if, if Belton could have pulled it off, if you could have put, you know, one, even just one company of guys with repeating rifles in the revolution, what a game changer that would have been. Yeah, it almost sounds like a, what a Harry Turtle doll like novel, like an alternate history. Like, yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. back with their fighting rifles to, to fight the British. Um, yep. Um, no, it's a cool story now. Uh, it's the one of those big what ifs, um, once again. Yep. Uh, um, another great question uh, from a guy named Alan says, what was the most common caliber of, uh, I guess, for musket balls or so for colonial forces, a con or musket? 69 and up. 69 and up. <laughs> So when you say 69, like, I'm, what does that mean? I mean, it's a dumb question, but let's... No, you're fine. So, so what that means um, is that if you measure across the diameter of the bore, uh, you're coming in at 69 hundredths of an inch. Um, oh. You know, so, so you're, you're, you know, we're closing in on three quarters of an inch diameter. We're, we're hurling a big piece of lead downrange. Um, you know, in terms of weight, um, the easiest comparison when, when we get to that conflict 80 years later, the, the standard conical bullet that they're firing, which is only 58 caliber, uh, it weighs more than an ounce. Um, they say it weighs, uh, I think, 13 copper pennies. If you were to hold 13 pennies in your hand, that's the equivalent weight uh, of a mini ball during the Civil War. And that is more than a tenth of an inch smaller in diameter uh, uh, for the bore. Um, so we're, we're hurling big pieces of lead. Um, the, the important thing to remember is it's big pieces of lead and they're moving slowly. <laughs> uh, and, and lead is soft, you know? And so as it's hitting guys, uh, it's, it's not just punching through them, you know? You, someone gets shot today and, and you, can, you can shoot right through them uh, if you've got a high enough velocity. That's not happening uh, with these giant soft lead bullets. They're going in, they're taking pieces of clothing in with them, they're deforming, they're smashing bones, and they're stopping 
and hanging out somewhere in your liver or your kidney or behind your shattered femur and you're screwed. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. So I mean, that's a, I mean, I, let me uh, clarify. It wasn't a dumb question by Alex. It was my dumb question. What 0.69 <laughs> meant. I mean, he had a great question. Yeah. It's they're what slow enough or they're fast enough to puncture a wound, but slow enough to bring everything in with it. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been, and maybe I've been, told or read and researched that like getting hit with a 0.69 caliber and up musket ball is like being slammed in the chest with a baseball bat i mean it, it is it is going to knock you even a yeah. spent bullet is going to bruise you correct yeah i i think i'd rather take the baseball bat you know i would i would yeah. rather take my chances with that you know um because yeah like you said it's it's taking in you know clothing and dirt and debris and everything and uh, and, and it's more often than not, it, the, the shot isn't what kills you. I mean, unless it's a, a head shot or if they hit a, you know, your heart or an artery or something like that, but it's going to be the disease that comes from the infection, uh, from the wound, because that's such a gaping hole that it's leaving in your body. It's yeah. I, since, uh, I haven't not, I've not eaten dinner yet, so we're not going to talk about gaping wounds, um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's, one of those things, I mean, the, the, the loading and fire, I mean, it is, is there much difference between muskets of the 18th century and muskets of the 19th century with loading and, and firing? Um, I mean, we hear like the word like take aim. Some in Colonial Williamsburg for a while, he said he didn't say take aim. Is that part of the manual of arms or is it the white of their eyes, white of their stockings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, well, to, to address the first part of that, you know, the, the difference in loading between 18th and 19th century arms, uh, the real delineation there is, is the difference between loading flintlock uh, and loading a percussion firearm. And so, uh, you know, with percussion guns, you've got that percussion cap that has your little bit of mercury fulminate contained in that little copper cap that sits onto the cone and your hammer hits that. Uh, and ignites it. So you are not igniting gunpowder with gunpowder. You're, you're using that mercury fulminate. But with a flintlock firearm, you are igniting powder with other powder. Uh, and so just as with a percussion gun, you are going to put your powder and your ball down the barrel of a flintlock musket. Uh, and once you ram that home, just like you would on a percussion gun, uh, you bring that gun up and bring your hammer to half cock. And where with a percussion gun, you'd put your percussion cap onto the cone, come to full cock and fire. Uh, you've got an extra step here uh, with, with your flintlock in that you have to prime the pan. Uh, and so you open up the frizzen on there. Let me, hold on, let me grab a flintlock. So people. There you go. It's exclusive on Red War, Red War. You are actually going to show, yeah, flintlock being. <laughs> yeah, so this, so this is a flintlock lock here. Uh, so this is your hammer, this is your pan, uh, and this is your frizzen here. And so you would bring uh, to bring it to cock, pour in your powder into the flash pan, and then it's stiff. <sighs> good to have a stiff, strong spring. It needs to. And then you close the frizzen on the pan and that prevents your powder from, you know, from getting wet or because, you know, it's powder, it'll blow out, you know, from, from wind or anything of that nature. And then I don't have flint in this one, but then when you pull the trigger, your flint comes down and hits the hardened face of the steel on the frizzen. And that pushes the pan, uh, it pushes the frizzen forward which gives access uh, into the pan where your powder is at. Uh, and then the spark from striking uh, your hardened face ignites the powder that's in your pan that goes through the touch hole into your barrel to ignite your charge. And so, so this is, here's the other side. This is what we're looking at. So these are all your, your internal lock mechanisms and stuff, but this this little U shape here, that's the other side of the pan. So your powder is sitting in here uh, and this is up against the barrel with the touch hole. So you are uh, hoping that your spark ignites the powder in the pan enough so that it travels through the touch hole into the barrel, if, if that makes sense. No, it does. You know, that's, uh, thank you for showing the, the mechanism. You can even see the word tower. So, I mean, obviously, as you said earlier, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, made a uh, musket there. Now, is it three still three shots a minute? Uh, we have another question. Or did, what was the standard? I mean, British yeah. Army could fire how many shots a minute? I would say three is still probably, you know, still probably the the goal of what you're shooting for. Um, you know, percussion isn't a whole lot faster so um, than flintlock. So it's it's still a long, drawn out process uh, to load there. So it's still, I mean, amazing. I mean, we always you watch anything on the History Channel or anything else. They're always holding the gun up here now. The gun has to go into your shoulder, correct? Because if you put up here in your face, still an 18th century weaponry, it's going to give you a concussion, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, you hold it into your shoulder uh, just like you would any other gun, but it, it, it is a little unnerving when, when that flintlock goes off because, like I said, you're, you're igniting a gunpowder charge fairly close to your face. Um, uh, and so it's 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 a little scary the first time you do it, but uh, I think we have to remember that that's that's all these guys knew, right? Yeah. You know, if you're going to shoot a gun, that's what's going to happen, uh, and so you you get used to it. Um, but but no, you just you you tuck it into your shoulder, uh, you know, as tight as you can, uh, and pull that trigger, and hope like hell that your your flint gives enough spark to actually go off. So. Um... Moving on a slightly bit. So with the, I mean, the end of the American Revolution, obviously you now have these U states, United States weapons, you've got all this. Uh, were the, so, I mean, do the soldiers give them back or did they take them with them? What, I mean, and then how many are these, do you know, have an account of how many of these muskets are still around? Right. Uh, so, so yeah, if it was your privately owned gun, obviously you, know, you take it back with you. Um, the whole point of them stamping the U states on them was to keep guys from walking off with them. Uh, although some guys still did, uh, you know, um, there are still examples that exist. Um, there is a, a, a U states stamped uh, canteen, wooden canteen that's at Valley Forge and is on display. Uh, and at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, uh, they've got uh, a gun stamped U States as well as a gun that's completely stamped United States on display. Um, so they are out there. You do see them. Um, uh, and, but, oh yeah, but to go back to your original point in that question, yeah, the, the guns that were essentially government marked um, remained government property. Um, but then, you know, obviously over the, the 200 years beyond that stuff filters out and and they make their way into private collections and museum collections. And um, even predating the revolution, uh, the town of Boston owned a number of flintlocks and it was actually uh, stamped into the stock of their guns, town of Boston, all three words. Uh, so there was no denying that that gun did not belong to you, Phil. You got that from the armory in the town, give it back. So, um, so yeah, so there still is some U States stuff floating around. Um, another common thing that we would see at the end of the war and then into post-war, particularly if we're dealing with foreign manufactured guns, uh, the lock plates will get stamped with US on there. So you may have this British lock that's been stamped US. Um, and those, uh, just like the, the other branded guns um, are highly collectible in the market today. And so uh, that's a, a good segue as we, um, I mean, we can talk about, I know Logan can talk about guns all night and, uh, <laughs> and so forth. Um, but um, with your experience, so let's, I want to give you a chance to talk about what is high caliber history? How did it form? What happened? I mean, because last you and I met, you were leaving the park service going to NRA and now you're in high caliber history. So sure, I'll uh, give you a chance to uh, talk about what HGH means on your chest there. Okay, so yeah, um, so you know, I've, I've got a degree in historic preservation with a concentration in museum studies. Um, and yeah, you and I, we, we met at the Park Service. I was working as a museum tech in the collection there. Um, and then I left and I went to the Smithsonian and I worked at the Smithsonian for a couple of years, uh, helping them with collections management and, and uh, things of that nature. And then uh, happened to see an advertisement for a firearms specialist 
Um, and I was sick of making that slog into DC every day. It's it, that's a pain. Um, and so I was like, wait a minute, you mean I can combine my love of firearms with my passion for history and my degree in museums and miracle of miracles, they're going to pay me to do it. Sign me up, you know? Um, and so I spent, uh, I spent just shy of five years uh, at the National Firearms Museum in Fairfax, Virginia, working there. Um, met a ton of wonderful collectors throughout the country. One of the things I did there was managed uh, the relationship we had with almost 100 affiliated gun collector clubs throughout the country. Uh, so I got to meet a lot of great people who had a lot of really interesting collections, a lot of Rev War stuff, uh, things of that nature as well. But uh, after five years of, of making that commute as well, uh, I, I decided it was, it was time for a change yet again. Um, and I had managed to build up enough connections and contacts that uh, it, was, it was time to take the plunge. And I, uh, I jumped off the cliff hoping that the parachute would open. Uh, and thankfully it did, didn't have to grab the emergency chute, <laughs> um, and, and high caliber history was born. And so, uh, I am a researcher and a writer and a consultant. Um, I work with museums. I work with a number of different publications. I work with auction houses. Um, I have people writing me, you know, trying to authenticate different pieces and, you know, is this gun in the right configuration or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I, I, I do a little bit of everything that try to tie together all of my history related stuff. Like I said, a, a lot of writing, lecturing, not so much given what has gone on this past year. It's good to start to be able to get back on the road yeah. um, and do some lecturing um but uh but yeah so uh, you know video content as well to help disseminate some stuff and a lot of you know on-site visits as well with lectures and collections examination um uh, helping out like i said with auction houses that that have historic guns that need to be identified and help them tell the story of, of those guns and the importance there um so it's uh it's it's been an interesting wild ride if uh if 10 years ago, no, if 12 years ago, when you and I met, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but. Wow, 12 years, okay, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but you know, 12 years ago, if you had said, hey, this is where you're gonna be, you know, in a little over a decade, oh, uh, never in a million years, I, I would have never imagined. Never a million years, or I think we had less facial hair then as well, didn't we? <laughs> um, uh, at that time, yeah. Uh, That's right. I'm, yeah. I'm impressed uh, with the, the, the growth there on the chin. Uh, so if so way wanted, longer than I'd care to admit. <laughs> uh, we'll talk after the pandemic. But if somebody wanted to reach you, uh, Logan, how, I mean, what's the best way? Um, the website, I mean, we'll put it up, but... Um, is that the best way? Highcaliberhistory.com, right? .com, yep, yep. So highcaliberhistory.com. From there, you can get to all the different social media platforms. Uh, you know, so pick your poison there. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and YouTube, putting out video content over there. Um, you can also email me, highcaliberhistory at gmail.com. Uh, but again, all of that uh, can be found at highcaliberhistory.com. If you have any questions or there's blog posts and information there, um, links to video content, uh, you know, that my, my sole purpose of things is, is to help disseminate information uh, and, and help people understand what they have. So if, you know, if, if you've got a question about granddad's shotgun that's, you know, been handed down to you or whatever, you know, reach out. I'm happy to help. I, uh, if I can help you, I will, but I'm not too proud to say, I, I don't know what that is, you know. Um, but the plus side to that is that I've got a lot of great connections. And even though I may not know what it is, chances are I know someone who does and, and I can put you in touch with them. So perfect. And for all those following, we put the, um, the his website, Logan's uh, website, High Caliber, High Caliber History, in the chat. <laughs> Um, it's also, I mean, connected on the blog post and so forth. Um, we, I will like, to, uh, before I sign off with Logan here, um, I will get in trouble if I don't mention that in two weeks, we have another Rev War, uh, Rev Worry. We're talking about the War of 1812, expanding a little bit into the War of Chesapeake. Um, next weekend, we have our Emerging Rebel War virtual symposium, hindsight's 2020-ish, because we're doing it in 2021. 
Um, and then in November, November 12th and 14th, we have um, our first uh, annual bus tour of Trenton and Princeton, the 10 crucial days. Um, all that information can be found on Emerging Revolutionary War blog. Um, but if you have any follow-up questions for Logan, um, obviously highcaliberhistory.com, all the social media platforms that he's on, or feel free to comment here uh, on this Rev War Revelry, which will be on YouTube as well, and we'll pass it on um, to, to Logan Metister. So um, thanks, Logan, for uh, taking an hour out of your Sunday here, de dealing with our IT difficulties, and also <laughs> talking about um, 18th century weaponry. So Thanks Absolutely. everyone for joining. Um, any final comment, Logan? Anything? Uh, one last word. You know, there, there's there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, just just dumb people who ask questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> just just kidding. Uh, no, seriously, it, uh, I'm I'm here to help, and and it's a you know it's a learning opportunity on both ends. You know, um, so so seriously, yeah. If you have any questions reach out to me, follow me on the different uh, social platforms. You know, I'm very interactive with people on all those there. So we can keep in touch that way as well. So. Perfect. So yeah, reach out to Logan, um, learn more about high caliber history, visit his website. Uh, but we'll see you guys in two weeks at uh, the next Red War Revelry as we talk War of 1812 on the Chesapeake. So uh, be safe, take care and have a good Sunday, everyone. Bye everyone.